All right, so we, I have the great pleasure today to introduce somebody who has, for a very long time, been the person in the field with by far the best sense of humor until he was recently overtaken by Martin O'D. Um, and uh, I would love to hear what he has to say for the next half hour. So, uh, oh, someone's written 20 minutes on the screen. He's got half an hour. Um, all right, then, there, off, over to you. Terrific. <clears throat> Thanks, Aubrey. Thank you, everyone. Good morning uh, from uh, New York. Um, I, I have to say, throughout human history, there were prophets. And retrospectively, those prophets have been either false prophets or two, true prophets. And I clearly remember uh, Aubrey walking uh, and, and looking as a prophet, as a biblical prophet. And it's just amazing to go just a couple of decades later and see that his prophecy, that we can do something about aging, there's a biology to that is flexible, has been true. And it's not only that we went from hope to promise, uh, we're now trying to realize the promise. Uh, so let me um, uh, give you some uh, insights about how I see the developing of biomarkers and my own research, our group uh, at Einstein have been uh, doing biomarkers basically around this amazing population. What you see here is a picture of uh, siblings who were born between 1910 and 1920 in New York City and all of them past the age of 102. Um, 102, the little sister died, everybody was shocked. She was 110, 107, uh, and 109. Uh, making the point that uh, longevity has, or exceptional longevity, have a genetic base, and that it's possible for us uh, to live actually healthy, to, to, to live longer, and to have a contraction of morbidity, and that was subject of some of my talks before. Beside those centenarians, and there are 750 centenarians that are also from a very homogeneous population of Ashkenazi Jew, homogeneous genetically, homogeneous um, socioeconomically, we also followed their offspring, uh, assuming that they, they inherited some of the genes for longevity and as a control for the offspring, we've been looking at the, mainly the people who are married to this offspring if they didn't have exceptional longevity in their family. And this is kind of the subject of this biomarker talk. Uh, what, what, what we're doing is lots of biomarkers. Our main aim is to identify longevity genes and to develop drugs around them, which we, we have done, but I'll show you today uh, some insights from proteomics that we've done in those subjects. And if I'm invited next time, there'll be methylation, there'll be metabolomics, um, and the interaction be uh, between them, and we, we'll re we really learned a lot. Um, you know, when we looked at the genetics, and I'm just giving you uh, one uh, example, where we ask, what's the difference between centenarians and control, those without longevity? Um, and we looked at rare genotypes that are less than 1% in the population, because so are the centenarians. They're less than 1% in the population. What, what we got is what Aubrey talked about, what we all knew from animals. It's those pathways of mTOR signaling, of insulin signaling, MAP kinase, and some, uh, some other things. And just remember uh, those pathways because we're getting back to them. But I'm not going to talk uh, much about that. Uh, just to mention that several drugs have developed in part based on our data. The second is that there's no one way to be 100. We have actually several pathways that are involved, although they are probably connected with each other, just like the hallmarks are, and that we need to find all the longevity genes and to do validation. And as the scientific director of the American Federation for Aging Research, I'm leading this uh, uh, initiative to uh, recruit 10,000 centenarians and their families, which we're doing by mail, basically, and getting back their DNA and sequencing and making available immediately all the genotypes uh, by exome sequencing of those centenarians. So if you know 
is centenaries we started we'll, we'll st we have started it in the united states we already have 250 or something like that but we'll expand it to other places so just a heads up those centenarians are really precious and i'll i'll, I'll convince you uh, more about it so when we talk about biomarkers uh, remember that it's one thing to see the difference between biological and chronological age what concerns me and in order to accelerate a uh, treatment eventually, we want to find the biomarkers that change within weeks uh, or, or months. And I just wanted to show you how difficult it is. This is my green age, right? And in my green age, I'm almost three years younger uh, than my, my chronological age. And I called Steve Horvath and I said, I'm really, really disappointed. He said, why are you disappointed? I said, because there are many markers, and one of them that's really amazing was developed by the Mayo Clinic, and it shows EKG age. By the way, by EKG, you can see, uh, it tells you if you're a man or, or, or a woman, which was nothing I knew that I could do by EKG, and they still don't understand exactly why. That's the advantage of AI. But they have developed an instrument that shows basically what's your EKG age or what's your heart muscle age, by the way. If you have coronary and you clog it the next day, it's not going to be healthy, helpful. And you see here that the first time I had my EKG, I was 58 years old, but my biological age was 54. And since then, I took, a, a, let's see if I have it, sorry, I took a, a metformin, and here I started intermittent fasting. And eight or nine years later, my heart age really haven't changed by that much. So basically, I told uh, Horvat, I need a few years uh, back. And there was a reason for that. Because in the green age, what, you, what they get is they get biological processes that are related to epigenetic changes to methylation changes and what you see in green is that each one of those processes i'm younger than my age except my hemoglobin a1c however my hemoglobin a1c during the last 10 years was around five it was quite low and for me it means that this epigenetic clock doesn't represent the fact that I've treated my epigenetic uh, problem. Uh, and, I, and I'm just demonstrating my own records here to show you it's really difficult. And methylation is not necessarily changing within, within a, a, a short period of time, dependent what and where and in, in which organ. So we took our children of centenarians and we uh, uh, our, our uh, the, the longitudinal study, which is children of centenarians and control, and we, by a uh, soma mare, we uh, technology, we looked at 5,000 proteins in 1,000 subjects, and we said, hey, what changes between the ages 65 and 95? And what what you get here is the, what I show here is the Volcano plot. So you see it's the p-value here, uh, the statistical uh, y-x is, is um, 10 to the minus 80, so I get really nice spread. Those are going up, those are going going down, and there's some that are changing with, with a really amazing effect size, such as the pro BNP. Now, the ones that are in bold are things that we knew from clinical studies that are actually changing with therapy. Okay, those are in, in, in black, I'm not going to tell you. But when you get a proteomic like that, you're asking yourself, is there a mechanism here? What are we seeing here? Are we seeing some proteins that are maybe causing aging? And more important, are we seeing some proteins that are protecting us from aging? Because if we have proteins that are protecting us from aging, we want them to be even higher. In fact, MIC-1 or GDF-15 and PTN when you express them in animals, they actually live longer. So you don't want to take those, those down. So 
some more insights about uh, those proteins. First of all, in which pathways they belong. And I'm going to make two points. First of all, it's always the insulin, IGF, all this pathway is coming up in our uh, centenarians all the time. By the way, 60% of our centenarians have something that impairs growth hormone and IGF action. It's the most common pathway that is involved. But the second is more important. A lot of, com of what comes up is breakdown. There's a, there's a degradation of extracellular metrics, platelet degranulation, collagen, collagen degradation, neutrophil granulation, collagen biosynthesis. And at first I said, okay, enough of this noise, but to realize that, you know what, maybe, maybe no matter how you treat aging, you have to stop the breakdown. And maybe those are going to be the biomarkers that are important. And proteomic biomarkers will change more rapidly than uh, changes in methylation, at least uh, generally, generally see. We can also use this proteomic to associate them with diseases or other conditions of aging. And here you have the uh, plot for frailty. Okay, so we had 143 patients with frailty. And, um, and when you look at their uh, proteome, the green represent those that are common with what we see with aging. But the red ones are are only those for frailty here you see it in here so we have less people so it's a smaller circle but half of it belongs to our big circle of aging but half of it is specific for example leptin is pretty much a biomarker of frailty so i think there is a biological way or a biomarker way to identify a, a frailty, and I can go on through other diseases and show there's some specificity in that. I think a very important and missed point is that there's a huge proteomic difference between men and women. Okay, so here you see that basically women have third the proteome. It's 600 proteins that are changing in men and 277 in women. Some of the proteins that are changing in women are specific for, for women. But I think we have to remember that if we are doing any proteomic clock, uh, either we do it different between male and female, or we use only the ones that are here. Uh, I told you that some of our subjects are the control without longevity. Those are offspring of parents with usual survival. And you can see only their proteome. The p-value here is 10 to the minus 50 because we have half of the population, but kind of it looks the same. And I'll tell you that the offspring of parents with exceptional longevity, the offspring of centenarians, clinically are about 10 years younger. Uh, they have half of the heart attacks, less cognitive decline, half of the mortality. And you can see it in the proteome because if you see here how red it is, you see that here it's much more white or pinkish. It's because the children of centenarians have only 235 compared to double that of the control. In 10, 10 years, they'll be the same. Now that doesn't show you that proteomic change by treatment, but it shows you that you can really depict a group of people by their proteome. Another interesting insight is from collaboration with the Campisi lab, where Judith is trying to identify the proteomes that are common to all senescent cells. And there, we, we have, she, she gave us 174 such proteins. Okay, so those are proteins that are secreted. Okay, that's how, that's how you find them, uh, that's how you uh, identify them. She's doing senescent by many ways, and she identified those proteins. And we have 114, and actually 31 of them were associated with significant uh, changes. The point I want to make here is that this is the Vulcano plot of those proteomes. But what's really interesting 
is basically half of them are going up and half of them are going down. Which means to me that the proteomes of the elderly is not really representing those SASP. Because if they were, if those are really protein that are secreted, they would be either not changing because, you know, they are locally, you know, doing something, or increase, but you wouldn't expect half of them to be down. So those are some bits of information about that. Um, uh, so one of the things we can start doing with, uh, with the proteins is develop those clocks, right? Like the clocks that, Har uh, that Harvard was developed. And initially the clocks are to really uh, show the relationship between um, chronological age and um, uh, biological age. And I, I don't want to go into that in a 20 minute, but and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that probably somebody else has already talked about some of those clocks and how you have to train them and what you do in, and, and how do you do validation. So this is on the left side, but I want really to, co to concentrate on this relationship between chronological and uh, biological age. Um, so, of, of course, those in green, when you're up there, you're relatively younger than the age. And, and if you're uh, bio biologically older, you're older than the age. And here is an, an example of a 74-year-old man with chronological age, whose actually biological age was predicted to be 86. And he's actually quite, uh, it's, it's she, and she's quite sick with anemia, with cardiac irregularity, diabetes, hypertension. So you kind of uh, really depict the, the biology on, on a clinical level as well. But really the clocks that we are developing are not only for biological age, they have to be, uh, for some reason, I cannot uh, pass my slide on, just a second. Okay, there I go. But, but with mortality. Um, so we had 148 deaths in our uh, population. And, uh, and so we are able to develop also a clock that will predict uh, mortality, which is kind of the final right endpoint for, uh, uh, for aging. We can also develop a clock for a certain disease. I told you that frailty has its own uh, uh, has its own uh, proteome, and so we can do that uh, as well. But I think what we're trying to do with our population in in many ways is to look at the resilience score. So we can go and identify the polygenic score of lots of diseases or, or of aging or of frailty, which has been done before, best done by the UK, uh, using the UK Biobank. But we want to identify the people who actually have the polygenic score for a disease, but seem to be protected from it. And, and this is our approach to our centenarians. What's the resiliency score rather than what's their disease score? So we can uh, look at a frailty resilience in, and, 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 and see what, what's the frailty resilience at those that are slow agers and fast ager. And basically, there is correlation between the frailty resilience and the, uh, the age acceleration, which is another term that I'm, I'm, I'm skipping. But, but to make the point that we can identify those frailty resilience people by using their polygenic score and then cor correlating them to clinical outcome. Now, we are trying uh, another initiative in AFAR uh, is uh, the FAST initiative. Actually, uh, I, I see I have it, Jamie Justice. Jamie Justice is a uh, uh, moving to, to, to better job, but Dan Bielski is now with me, are leading this project. And the idea of this project is to find omics in, that have done, that from, uh, from material, from resources, 
that have been established from clinical studies. Um, the studies that we're looking at are the DPP, I'll tell you in a minute what it is, GL, GL, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, GLP-1, and also other trials, whether small trials on rapamycin and other things. And the idea is, let's take those plasma and those blood and subject them to the same methods, state-of-the-art methods, and see within a year of therapy, within a year, maybe months of therapy, to see what are the change in biomarkers um, that are a, a, a specific for this treatment, but then bring them all together and see what are the biomarkers that are common to those drugs that target aging. We are making a, a progress with the DPP. The DPP was a study, a clinical study, a, that looked at the effect of placebo, metformin and lifestyle change of diet and exercise in preventing diabetes. It's a study that was uh, stopped early and uh, because the results were significant to both arm uh, of treatments and the plasma is stored at an NIH biorepository and, and we got uh, permission or we're, we're in this process of establishing those process and they'll be the first to go up. And again, we're going to do methylome and proteome and metabolome and, and probably some, uh, some other things. So I think it's 20 minutes, 22 minutes. I want to stop and, 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 and say what I haven't, I haven't demonstrated. I haven't demonstrated with proteome, or what we haven't demonstrated is that we have consistently changed within weeks and months. And now I'm, I'm, I'm wearing another hat. Of, I'm executive in the Longevity Biotech Association. All the biotechs, when they do a phase two trial, we want to show that our biomarkers are going to the right direction. It will help us save main, may, maybe a billion dollar of a phase three trial if we could just have this data. I haven't shown you that protomic change rapidly, but I am believing that it does. And the last thing is that the proteomics that we have, uh, and in collaboration with Tony Weiss Corre, uh, is coming, we know which organs they are coming from. In other words, within this proteomics, we can identify if your aging is led by your liver or your brain more. Uh, so we can see, so I think the proteomic is going now to organ-specific proteomic for aging that will be even more helpful than just knowing the biological age uh, itself. So I want to stop here and, uh, and thank you for uh, listening. And I don't know if uh, you want me to take uh, questions. Yeah, of course, of course you want to use that questions now. Absolutely. Uh, who, who would like to ask the first one? I see a hand out there. Who's the microphone carrier? Where are the volunteers gone? Somebody get that person. There you go, behind you. Thank you. Hi, Professor. Uh, first of all, a big fan of your work. And uh, I was going to ask you a few questions about microbiome and centenarians, because I see a lot of groups have established some signatures for both functional and the microflora signatures. So we are trying to do that in India. Uh, I just had a couple of questions for you is that first is that how much do you think uh, are the microbiome signatures valid to predict extreme longevity for centenarians? And secondly, of course, for a country like India, it's really difficult to qualify centenarians uh, based on the documents that are usually required. So how do we work around that? Uh, so, so let me start by telling you, uh, when microbiome became a thing, I was thinking we should go to the centenarians and establish their stool. And we found out that it's really difficult to tell a hundred year old to, you know, to collect stool. <laughs> and, 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 and so I was looking for the field to develop in a way that will make me do that. And, and it hasn't yet. Uh, not that I don't think microbiome are important, but generally microbiome in a certain individual don't change with age. Uh, they do change with extreme age when they move to a different location, when they are treated with antibiotics. 
And I'm not sure when, there, and there's certain studies of centenarians in their stool that show a unique, but not similar between groups, a unique uh, microbiome. And I'm not sure if there's a cause and effect relation relationship with it. So I'm just saying I'm not yet there. Uh, I think that this is very important uh, thing, and I wish you really good luck, but I don't have insights, I'm sorry. No problem. Next question. Who's got a microphone? Yeah, uh, question on the left. Yes, thank you. In your studies of the biomarkers of aging, have you uh, obtained any insights as to what might be responsible for the difference in maximum lifespans between males and females? Why are the longest lived female supercentenarians consistently a few years older than the longest lived male supercentenarians? Um, yeah, so um, I, I, fe I feel responsible for Aubrey who introduced me as, as, as making good jokes and I'll kind of answer uh, first, with the joke, uh, in our in our uh, in our tradition, the, the answer of why husbands die before their wives is because they want to. Okay, <laughs> but but, but 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 the biology, the, the the there is a proteomic biology. There are genotypes that are similar, and some that are different between men and women. And, and so I don't know the final answer for that, but it's definitely different on the genotype level, or not definitely somewhat different on the genotype level and the proteomic level, just as I exhibited before. It is possible that the reason that the proteome of women is more stable, we call it, is because they're actually younger than the men, right? I showed you that the offspring of centenarians are younger. Maybe what we're depicting is the women are relatively younger. And maybe if we uh, take their proton between 70 and 100, it, it will be the same. Uh, but no, not about the mechanism by which the lifespan is different. Thanks. Last question. Hi, yeah, um, I hope you're not bored with people asking you, but what, what is the status of the TAME uh, project? And also, um, since you like a joke, are you Ray Kurzweil's younger brother? Because you look an awful lot like him. <laughs> Sorry, whom? Ray, <laughs> Ray, Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> that was a very good answer. Very good answer. Ray Kurzweil. Um, uh, I, I only know that they ask him if he's near Barzilai. That's the only thing I know. Uh, so, uh, so okay. So the Tain trial, um, I, I'm 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 trying not to answer because I always think I jinx it. But what we have now, we have commitment for third of the money, and we are trying now to close the gap and start it as soon as possible. Unfortunately, that's the answer I've been giving, or similar answer I've been giving for years. I, I want to make sure that you understand the TAME study is still really important. I mean, everybody understands that. It's still really important for many reasons. We have to have this proof of concept. We have to have the FDA come with us on board. We have to have a therapy that's cheap that we can immediately make available to others. We need the pharmaceuticals to understand that there's a reason for them to jump in. I can go on and on. The study is very important and it will happen. I'm just sorry for the delay. It was because of billionaires that lost their money, because of COVID, because of other things. But we do hope to get it back online. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to congratulate you now for your resilience and persistence in keeping going, trying to make this thing happen, because of course you're completely right. It's a vital piece of what we need to do. All right then, thanks so much, Nair, um, for coming.